Good Sabbath, everyone. So this morning, I was going to see if someone wanted to uh, give, read the scripture verse. I thought I had to twist some arms, of it. apparently, I didn't have to do much twisting because she said, sure, I'll do it. So, Philippians 4, 6 through 7, sure. or 9. Just 9. 9. Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So I want to start off with a little story this morning. There once was a king who offered a prize to the artist who would paint the best picture of peace. Many artists tried. The king looked at all the pictures, but there were only two he really liked, and he had to choose between them. One picture was a calm lake. The lake was a perfect mirror for peaceful, towering mountains that were all around it. Overhead was a blue sky with fluffy white clouds. And all who saw this picture thought that was the perfect picture of peace. The other picture had mountains too, but these were rugged and bare. Above was an angry sky from which rain fell, and in which lightning played. Down the side of the mountain tumbled a foaming waterfall. This did not look peaceful at all. But when the king looked, he saw behind the waterfall a tiny bush growing in the crack in the rock. In the bush, a mother bird had built her nest. There, in the midst of the rush of angry water, sat a mother bird on her nest. Perfect peace. And the king chose the second picture. And do you know why? Because, explained the king, peace does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. Peace means to be in the midst of all those things and still be calm in your heart. That is the real meaning of peace. Now, when Ann Landers, and everyone's heard of Ann Landers, when she had her column still running, it received around 10,000 letters a month from people requesting advice on various topics. When asked what her most common question was, she answered that people seem to be afraid or worried about something. They're afraid of losing their health. They worry about their job, and they're filled with concerns about their family. People are whacked out about their neighbors or frustrated with their friends. A great preponderance of letters describe relational ruptures and family friction. We don't ever see that, do we? In short, people are looking for peace, but they can't seem to find it. Peace is regarded as one of the supreme virtues, and yet is often absent from our lives today. From road rage to peaceful protests, our culture does not partake of peace on a regular basis. When was the last time we heard about a peaceful protest ending peacefully? Peace, we long for it. We wish we had it, but we seldom find it. Even in the church, we don't always see it. That leads to a question, why is that some people have peace while others of us are going to pieces? Peace is also the third character quality that Paul lists in Galatians 5. In this passage of scripture, we have a list of the characteristics that God desires to produce in us as we allow the Holy Spirit to control our lives. And in Galatians 5, 22 through 23 reads, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, wouldn't it be great to really be at peace? To close your eyes and be alone with your heart and feel not scattered, not hectic, not hurried, not stretched, but rather to feel calm, to feel solid, to feel centered, to feel that it is well. Wouldn't it be great to wake up in the morning and smile, welcoming the day ahead, because deep in your soul you are at peace with yourself and your life? Wouldn't it be great to have something difficult or painful come hurtling toward you and be able to react, 
not with panic or fear, but with the calm assurance that whatever the problem, you know God is going to walk with you through it all and even bring good out of it. Wouldn't it be great to really, truly, honestly be at peace? And that is the peace that Jesus Christ came to bring. That is what God promises will be our experience if we walk with Jesus and allow him to be our Savior and the Lord of our lives. The fruit of the Spirit can only come from the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. He alone is the source and supplier of peace because he is the God of all peace. Only as we stay connected to the vine will we be able to know and experience this peace. The only place we will find it is through Jesus. The child that laid in the manger, who would grow into the man, who would die on the cross. Now before we define what peace is, let's look at what it is not. Peace is not merely the absence of activity. We often use the phrase, peace and quiet, to refer to our need of slow down. Peace is more than the absence of hostility. The biblical concept is much deeper than just not having any conflict. Peace is not just getting away from reality. While we go on vacation to get away from it all, the Bible offers peace right where we are. In the Old Testament, the word shalom is a state of wholeness and harmony that is intended to resonate in all relationships. When used as a greeting, shalom is a wish for outward freedom from disturbance as well as inward sense of well-being. To a people constantly harassed by enemies, peace was their premier blessing. In Numbers 6, 24 through 26, God gave Moses these words to use when blessing his people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The New Testament describes at least three spheres or planes of of peace. Peace with God, which is the vertical dimension. Peace of God, and this takes place internally, and peace with others. When we have peace with God and we experience the peace of God, we can extend peace horizontally. Zephaniah 3.17 says, He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. In order for us to move forward in our journey to joy, we must first recognize that God rejoices over us with singing. God breaks out into joy when he thinks about us. And while this is certainly true, and we need to let it soak into our spirits, there's a corollary to this biblical truth. Because you've been created in the image of God, you matter greatly to him. But due to the devastating effects of sin, before we come to faith in Christ, you and I are also considered to be at war with God. Romans 5.10 refers to us as enemies of God. God was your enemy, and you were his adversary. And this is hard to swallow because many of us do not feel like we have been at war with God. While we might not think we are fighting him, the Bible clearly teaches that he is at war with those who do not know his son. God is the enemy of sin and Satan. Before you came to Christ, you were a child of darkness and were therefore locked in conflict with the Almighty. Ephesians 2.3 adds that we were, by nature, objects of God's wrath. Psalm 7.11 puts it strongly, God is a righteous judge, a God who expresses his wrath every day. Before we can understand this first mention of peace, we must first come to grips with the state of our relationship with God apart from Christ. While God loves us and cherishes us, he is also repulsed and filled with indignation because of our sinfulness. Romans 1.18, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And that's the bad news. We look at Romans 5, 1 for the good news. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, you and I can now be at peace with God. This word also can mean to set one again. 
God the Father poured out his wrath, fury, and indignation on his Son, who died in our place as our substitute. Colossians 1.20 says that Jesus reconciled himself to all things, making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, I want to make this perfectly clear. We do not deserve this peace. In fact, what we deserve is death and eternal punishment. But because of God's great love, he provided a way for us to be set at one again with the God of the universe. God's joy and his justice converge on the cross of Calvary. His love and his law find full satisfaction through the sacrificial death of his son. God is both just and the justifier. His fury is fully absorbed and resolved in the sacrifice of Jesus. And when we put our faith in Christ, we are justified, which means that we've been declared righteous and at peace with God forever. This is a positional truth. Your acceptance and peace with God does not depend on you. It all depends on Christ. My sins do not cancel out my justification or shatter my peace with God. Romans 8.1 is a great reminder. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Peace of God. In order to have the peace of God internally, we must first experience peace with God vertically. The upward dimension must be taken care of before inward peace can permeate our lives. On the night Jesus was born, the great company of the heavenly host appeared, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. This peace comes to those on whom God's favor rests. And who is that? It's those of us who have been justified by faith in Christ. Those at peace with God can experience the peace of God. Shortly before Jesus died, he declared in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This inner peace is a gift from Jesus and comes to us as a key element of the fruit of the Spirit. We will experience this peace in proportion to the room we give the Holy Spirit in our lives. The more room you give, the more peace you get. Every one of Paul's 13 letters begins with a greeting of peace. Some of them end with it as well. The church at Thessalonica was, needed this encouragement because they suffered from oppression and persecution. They were confronted with a problem of immorality. They were grieving over those who had died, and they were battling false teachers. Listen to Paul's final greeting to this church in 2 Thessalonians 3.16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. And how can we experience this kind of inner peace at all times and in every way? If we look at this scripture for this morning, Philippians 4, we'll go 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We're told, first of all, to not be filled with anxiety about things of life. Most of us are walking civil wars, where we are inundated in worry and concern. Paul's a realist, so he knows that we can't just determine not to be anxious, and suddenly we're flooded with peace. It doesn't work that way. I'm sure everyone has tried it. You can't will yourself to tranquility. The path to inner peace passes through prayer. The word petition carries with it the idea of being specific about our wants, needs, and problems. We're going to do this with thanksgiving. Being careful to have an attitude of gratitude for what God has already done for us. The picture here is that we come to the throne of grace with our arms filled with cares and concerns, and then we hand them to God. Once we present our request to God, his peace will come flooding into our lives. And I want you to notice that it's God's peace, and only he can give it to us. Just like we can't manufacture the fruit of love or joy, so too we cannot pretend to have peace when we really don't. 
This peace passes all understanding, which means that it goes all way, by, way beyond all that we can even ask or imagine. Our minds cannot even fathom this kind of supernatural peace. Only when it ambushes us can we begin to taste it. The word guard is a military term meaning to protect a camp or castle. When God's peace floods our lives, it will protect our hearts and minds against enemy attacks. Do you have this kind of inner peace? If you're a believer, it is not only available to you, God expects that you display peace on a regular basis as a fruit of the Spirit, as it matures in your life. And it's really rather simple. Don't be anxious about anything, but if you are, then present your request to God. And when you do, His supernatural and profound peace will come and protect you so that you won't be filled with worry and anxiety. Everything kind of circles back to prayer. Peace with others. Peace with God enables us to have peace of God. Christ as Savior brings peace with God. Christ as Lord brings the peace of God. And another way to say it is that we can't have the peace of God until we know the God of peace. That then leads us to our third point. We're called to live at peace with others. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. And it's rather interesting that Jesus did not tell us to be peacekeepers, but instead peacemakers. And it takes effort to bring conflict to an end. When we work at preventing contention and strife, we are doing what God does. We are called to make peace when we're involved in conflict with someone and when we see others involved in skirmishes. Romans 14, 19 lays out our responsibility. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Now let's look at some very practical ways that we can live at peace with others. When relationships are out of sync, we need to take action to make them right and productive. Whether we are the offender, the offended, or the innocent bystander. In a tiny book of Philemon, it's always a goofy, goofy name to say. I looked it up. It was Philemon, according to Google. <laughs> but as Pastor Tim shared a few weeks ago, we have a biblical model of three people to work to bring about peace. And even though we went through this with Tim, we'll go ahead and take a look at it again briefly, as it is a really good illustration for this. So for a quick synopsis, one is the offender, another is the offended, and the third tries to reconcile them. Written while Paul was in prison, this letter is addressed to Philemon. Paul's purpose is to bring peace between Philemon and his escaped slave Onesimus, who had fled to Rome where he had converted under Paul's ministry. First, Paul the reconciler. Paul went out of his way to reconcile Philemon and Onesimus. He could have just stayed out of it, but he chose to be a peacemaker. Verse 13 mentions that Onesimus was assisting Paul in ministry, but Paul wanted him to go back and make things right with Philemon. Do you know how, do you know of people who aren't talking to each other? Are you aware of relationships that have broken down? We must be willing to take action when we see people at odds with each other. Second, Onesimus the repenter. Peacemaking in a, in a body requires not only one person who is willing to take the initiative, but also people who are willing to be reconciled. When Onesimus escaped from Philemon's household, he apparently stole something. Now after being converted, he wanted to make things right, so he was making the 1,000-mile journey back to his master. Paul was sending this letter with him to encourage Philemon to forgive Onesimus. Have you ever wronged someone? Then take the necessary steps, no matter how long the journey, to be reconciled. As repenters, we must be willing to acknowledge our sins and go to those whom we've offended. Third, Philemon the receiver. In a culture without slavery, it's hard for us to realize the magnitude of Paul's request. Philemon was asked to receive his runaway, thieving slave, not as a piece of property, but as, a, as verse 16 says, as a dear brother in the Lord. Do you need to forgive and restore someone this morning? The need, the need for receivers is paramount in the body of Christ. As receivers, we need to offer the forgiveness and mercy that people need so that we can live in peace with each other once again. 
Reverend Brian Hill gave an illustration I want to share. Sam Smith and Joe Jones were not talking to each other. This deeply concerned Bob Brown, is, so he got together with Sam Smith and asked, what do you think of Joe Jones? Sam quickly responded, he's the biggest jerk in town. Bob stopped him and said, you've got to admit that he's a good dad, right? Smith readily agreed, yeah, he's definitely a family man. The next day, Bob Brown went up to Joe Jones and said, do you know what Sam Smith said about you? No, but I can't imagine anything good coming out of his mouth. Bob then said, this may surprise you, but he said that you are very kind to your family. So what do you think of Smith, asked Bob Brown. Truthfully, I believe he's a low-down scalawag. But you have to admit that he's very honest in business, don't you? Joe responded, without a doubt, you can definitely trust him in business. The next day, Bob called on Sam again and said, you know what Jones said about you? He claims that you're an honest businessman and that your word can be trusted. What do you think happened the next time these guys saw each other? The point Reverend Hill was making is that you and I are sometimes called to be holy meddlers. To work at making peace when we know what people are sideways with each other. And if you were to think about it, there's more conflict between brothers and sisters in Christ than we care to admit. If you want to experience the fruit of peace, we must be vigilant about keeping our relationships with each other healthy. Satan loves to divide and con create conflicts. Jim Cimbala, the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York, says that the Holy Spirit is a dove that soars away when there is division. And they instituted a policy for the world-famous Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, which has won six Grammys and seven Dove Awards. The first time we hear you talk about another choir member in a negative way, there will be no warning. You'll be asked to leave the choir. And during the church membership classes, Cimbala challenges believers with this charge. The moment you hear someone speak anything bad about someone, you stop them in mid-sentence and say, have you talked to that person yet? If you haven't, go to him right now. Gossip is slaying many churches today. Two utterly excited Southern women were sitting together in the front pew of church listening to a fiery preacher. When this preacher condemned the sin of stealing, these two ladies cried out at the top of their lungs, Amen, brother. And when the preacher condemned the sin of lust, they yelled again, Preach it, reverend. And when the preacher condemned the sin of lying, they jumped to their feet and screamed, Right on, brother, tell it like it is. Amen. But when the preacher condemned the sin of gossip, the two got very quiet. One turned to the other and said, He's quit preaching, now he's meddling. We should make the commitment to not speak bad about each other. Let's give grace and not spread slander. Ephesians 4.29 do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Peace. I found this and hope it will help reinforce a few things. P. Plan a peace accord. Sometimes we don't have a third party who will take the initiative to put this together. But if you sense conflict with an individual, the Bible says not to wait for him or her to make the first move. Matthew 5, 23 through 24 and Matthew 18, 15 established that whether you are the offender or the offended, the ball is always in your court. Take the first step and do it right away. The longer you wait, the harder it will become. E, empathize with their feelings. When you sit down with a person, the first thing you should do is listen. To what he or she is feeling. Remember that your view is your view. You've been given a single porthole through which to look at life. It's a valuable porthole, but it only exposes you to a portion of the ocean. Philippians 2 4 says, Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. The word look is the Greek word skopos, from where we get the word scope, as in telescope or microscope. It literally means to focus on or pay attention to. If we want to make peace with someone, we must take the focus off our needs and hurts and consider what the other person is feeling. Often we'll discover that the person is himself hurting about something. 
A, attack the problem, not the person. We're called to speak the truth in love in Ephesians 4.15. This means that we are to practice truthing in love. Talk truth, but don't pound on the person. We're never persuasive when we're abrasive. We can't get to our point across by being cross. So if you say something offensively, it'll be received defensively. C. Cooperate as much as possible. Jesus reminds us that it's very easy for us to have a plank hanging out of our eye when we notice a little speck of dust in someone else's. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If we want to live, out, live at peace, we must be willing to compromise or give a little. James 3.18 says, Peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of goodness. In a relationship, whatever we sow, we're going to reap. If you plant seeds of peace, you're going to reap a peaceful relationship. If you plant seeds of inflexibility, you're going to reap conflict. And E, emphasize reconciliation, not resolution. And there's a big difference between these two words. Reconciliation means and means and consider what the other person I'm sorry. Reconciliation means to reestablish the relationship and let peace reign. Resolution means to resolve every issue. Second Corinthians five nineteen reminds us that God has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. We can disagree without being disagreeable. You and I can have unity without uni- we can have unity without uniformity, and we can walk hand in hand without seeing eye to eye. So we have some action steps. Since peace is part of the fruit of the Spirit, we should see it ripen in our lives. The fruit is both a gift and a task. And here are some steps we can put into practice so that we'll partake of peace on a regular basis. One, make peace with God. If you have never made peace with God yet, this is your first step. One day, a young man went into his pastor in great distress because all of the anxiety and friction he had in his life. He asked the pastor, can you tell me what I must do to find peace? The minister replied, young man, you're too late. The man was devastated. You mean it's too late for me to be saved? The pastor smiled and said, oh no, but you're too late to do anything. Jesus did everything that needed to be done 20 20 centuries ago. Have you made peace with God? And I'm not talking about a truce. A truce is saying, God, you stay on your side of the line, and I'll stay on my side. You handle all the big problems of the world, and I'll handle my life. That's not peace. Just look at North and South Korea. Peace is what will take place when you acknowledge your sins. Believe that Jesus died in your place on the cross and receive him into your life by faith. Are you ready to do that? Number two, identify one thing you are worried about right now. Give it to God in prayer. Don't hold on to it. Present it to God, and you'll experience a peace that is beyond anything that you can manufacture on your own. Inner peace comes as we practice the power of prayer. And number three, say something good when someone says something bad. When you hear gossip, give the gift of grace by immediately speaking a kind word about the person being talked about. And this can help let us know when we're slipping into unwholesomeness. If you are talking about someone and someone else starts billing that person up, you'll know right then that you've slipped into slander. Remember, we are looking for an internal peace. It is not absence of the external battle, both spiritual and physical, that we see daily. It's the depth of our souls, knowing who God is and who we are as God's children, and thus knowing peace in whatever situation we find ourselves in. It is not the picture of calm, glassy lake. It's the bird on its nest in the midst of the storm and the waterfall. And I want to leave you with a few words from St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. 
For it is in giving that we receive. It is in parting that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Go to God and pray that you find an eternal peace. Find that calm in the storm we are always finding ourselves in. Just look at the news and you see the storms are brewing. But through Jesus, we can have our peace. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning so longing for that peace. We see a world that is torn by war and disagreement and pain. And Lord, we come to you asking for that peace so we can feel that calm that you so much want to give us. And Lord, we know that calm can be contagious to others. People see that calm in us and they just want it for themselves, Lord, and we can bring more people to you. Lord, we ask for the strength so that we can give up some of our problems to get that peace. Because giving control over our lives, Lord, is one of the hardest things we can do. But it can be the easiest thing as well. As you have already offered to forgive our sins, Lord, if we just come to you and ask for forgiveness and accept your Son as our Lord and Savior. We pray this in your name. Amen.